the second things uh, I tell you is that many of the things that uh, uh, the, many of the things I will going to tell you uh, are not the most relevant things, and I have no words to express what is the most relevant thing. So uh, there is, a, in my point of view, an over intellectualization of the activism space in the Western culture. Um, severe mass severe resistance episode happen from two to five times per year in the globe. And the usually happen, open, up, happen in the South, in the global South. And those people are not professional activists, are, uh, are not professional intellectual. Most of the people that are engaged in real civil resistance processes. So what I tell you, that I can tell you as much as I know, and it's not that much, uh, about how to organize, but the problem is uh, how much are we emotionally connected with the issue of the possible extinction of the human race? So this is the real problem. So uh, <laughs> I won't be here if uh, the first step for me was not sitting and blocking a motorway alone two years ago because I was frustrated. And uh, I, I speak recently with many of the leaders of civil resistance in other uh, Western countries, and we all had the same experience of being arrested alone because we were frustrated from inaction. And uh, this was uh, completely irrational, and this was extremely relevant for us being in the position we are now uh, for many psychological reasons, which are extremely more important in every technicalities, like we say. So I will go on. I have some slides, those are in Italian. And um, I'm of course, we have not that many time, and I want to emphasize some of the key misunderstanding about civil resistance, and then going on with C, the key designing factors, which may lead to maximizing success. So as far as we all know, this is um, a very famous graph, which was made by Harry Caccino and Steven. I won't get, I won't get too much into detail about it. Um, but uh, what it says is that uh, in from uh, 1900 to, to, to 2006, uh, um, there have been many episodes of revolution, non-violent revolution or violent revolution. Uh, what happened is that uh, uh, non-violent revolution are more than the double, more effective to bring a legislative change or to bring down a government than violent uh, revolution on the average. The other things which is extremely relevant and uh, we mostly don't understand in Western society is that those are not elections. So those episodes never bring the majority of the population with you. And uh, the vast majority of the population will always be inactive in most the revolutionary episodes. So what we see down here is the participant per capita, okay? And what we see on the a vertical line is the probability of success for the, for the quantity of participants. And what we see is that uh, around 1% people mobilize, uh, there is almost 40% of uh, bringing down a government. Around 1.5, there is more than 50% of chances of bringing down a government. What we also know, and it is quite terrifying, is that um, we have also some specific data on uh, uh, why we are going to be ineffective in the last 30, 40 years to bring uh, some uh, uh, legislative change. So this study was made in 2012. Uh, this study has been made anew and uh, uh, Erika Chinuet, which is a statistician, has analyzed uh, more than 500 revolutions. And, uh, um, and she has slightly changed the time period analyzed. And she has focused on 90, 2019. And what we see, if we see the gray line, and what we see, if we see the black and white line, the gray line is nonviolent revolution episodes. The black and white line is the violent uh, revolution episodes, is that both are drastically decreasing in their ability of bringing change. And what they bring as uh, the main reason is the lack of uh, structural organization of uh, the evidence. So I, I make an example, which is crystal clear according to me, 
maybe are the Indignados in, Sp in Spain, 2010, or Occupy Wall Street, the same year or the day after, okay? Um, what mostly happened is that, that there was a very powerful, spontaneous, uh, semi-spontaneous mobilization of uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And, uh, um, but there was no clear demand to the government. So I, I've talked with one of the main organizer, organizer, organizer three days ago, and I asked him, there was no, and I asked him if it's real, and they had no clear demo to the government. They had some uh, uh, general topic, like we want direct democracy, but what the hell does it mean? Step by step, how do you proceed to create direct democracy? How, how, how do we win? How do we win a victory? step by step. And uh, after six months of um, uh, adrenaline, of uh, spontaneous organization, what happened is that uh, most of the people didn't know what to do next because there was no an organization which was ready to tell what we have to do next in order to bring on further step for uh, uh, going on with the conflict with the state. And this happened very often recently in the last 30 years which we have made a lot of spontaneous or, or spontaneous mobilization in the Western society, but there was no an official uh, organization which was structured to last five, 10 years in order to make a revolution and to apply general tact various tactics and to create a, a vision and a strategy which was made step by step uh, as in many of the great episodes of civil resistance in the history. So um, there is a first of all, if you want to design civil resistance, uh, general incomprehension about the general public. So this is a spectrum of values. Um, when you start civil resistance, uh, what you have to understand as a first focus is that uh, um, you have to target the general public if you want to have a vast, a pro, a vast effect on public opinion. So um, I try to make an example. Um, uh, as A22 network, we produce random trials. When there was the famous uh, throwing the tomato soup on Van Gogh, we had made an experiment in several places contemporaneously. So there was some people that was spray painting uh, uh, um, <coughs> Scotland Yard. There was some people that was uh, spray painting uh, the, um, some luxury uh, shops. And there was two girls with a red tomato soup that were throwing uh, the red tomato soup on Van Gogh at the National Gallery in London. And so what people know, people know about the girls, uh, because, because um, what we always ask ourselves is um, not what is the right thing to target, no? the banks, uh, the government, but what is the thing that affect the public, affect the public attention. So more or less it's like advertisement works. You, know? you, have, uh, you look at an advertisement and there is uh, maybe an actor which is sexy, and uh, then there is a car, and uh, the actor tells you, buy the car. People buy the car, not for the car themselves, uh, but, uh, uh, but because there was an actor, and the actor was sexy, okay? This is more or less the same point with attracting the public opinion. Many times what we think is directly engaging with the power is not effective on public opinion, because you are not striking imaginary of people. And what happens generally in uh, conflict, uh, nonviolent conflict in Western society, is that at the beginning, everyone will think you that you are stupid and that, all right, and most of the people will hate you. And uh, there will be a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of talking that will say that your methods alienate the common people and uh, you are making a bad point of your <coughs> right cause. But uh, the, right, the problem is that those are general arguments. What we can use in order to understand step-by-step step what is happening, that we can more or less uh, uh, share, uh, slice the population into active opposition, which usually is the government or uh, the police or, uh, um, or uh, the fossil fuel companies in our case. We can have the passive opposition, which is means uh, maybe people that only watch uh, uh, some uh, right-wing uh, talk show. Then we have all the people which is neutrals, the people which is neutrals that says, okay, I don't like the way you protest, but you are right. And those are the vast majority. Really. Then we have the passive allies, which is maybe our, uh, uh, the relation between us and you. I think that uh, most of you are allies in some way that we can help each other, but maybe we are not allies. So we are not in the street together in this moment. 
And uh, when you see the population, you have to understand that there are many positions according to your movements and according to what you're bringing to the public. And uh, that uh, we, when someone comes to us and say, everyone hates you because what you're doing is like blocking motorways is stupid. We have to be clear that it's not that easy, okay? And there are many several intermediate position and uh, we have to analyze the intermediate position and understand how to make a change so that uh, the passive opposition becomes neutral, the neutral become passive and the passive become hollies and get to the street together. And there are many ways of doing this. Of course, we have to look at the details. But um, the main point is that uh, in order to understand, uh, um, to understand uh, civil resistance, there is to make um, a non-reductionistic analysis of what conflict means. So um, I like a lot the sentence of Martin Luther King, who says, a genuine leader is not a searcher for consensus, but a molder of consensus. Um, so what does it mean? The usually way of looking at conflicts uh, is uh, A, the, the activist, non-violent disrupt B, public, in time one. So the activists are in the motorway and the public is indignated and so they become oppositor because you, if you create disruption to the public, the public will hate you. This is the way the press will try to drive the situation, but the situation is much more sophisticated and intelligent than this. And it is a holistic situation generally. So at the point A, at the point one, the, the activists disrupt the public, okay? And the public becomes uh, opposition. So they are eating it, they are hungry, but you go on because uh, there is something more important than what the public thinks about you. And so at the point two, you disrupt the public again. And at the point three, you disrupt the public again. And with this process, what we see uh, with some data, and I will offer you some data, is that many people become passive support or active support. And the more you distort them in a non-violent way, the more they become close to you. And it is what happens more or less very often in our daily life when uh, we think we are right and uh, um, someone has um, a big point. Uh, we have a big point on a, like on a family problem, no? Maybe uh, our brother is beating our sister, and and everyone uh, uh, and everyone uh, pretends that, that is not happening. And you go to the table um, and the, to the dinner, and you say, "I don't want you to beat my sister anymore," and uh, in front of everyone. And of course, it will be upsetting, and everyone will be upset with you. But you make the second time, the third time, and people will sit at the table, most probably, and try to solve this big problem. And the same thing is happening with society. And when you disturb society in a non-violent way. So we never have to look at clone at conflict uh, like in a single time frame. Of course, if I go to Dazan and I tell Dazan some, uh, um, some strong things uh, which are true, uh, Dazan will be not happy at the first time. But uh, this is an iterative process that takes time in order to bring change. So we never have to be afraid to disturb the general public uh, because it pays off as long as you sustain. So. The problem is not uh, so disturbing or not disturbing the public, is how much do you disturb the public? How long and with many people? This is the real problem in order to bring a uh, change in public opinion and hence specific legislation. So um, I want to give you some data about this. Um, some data that has been collected by the massive experiment made in the Western countries by A22 Network last year. Um, there are two different surveys. Um, that, um, that have been come out at one year distance. Um, when there was in Great Britain, it was the experiment that came, uh, that came before uh, uh, just a boil in UK. There was people blocking motorways for two months, uh, asking for home insulation, because it's a very social, uh, uh, social justice problem in England. And uh, they made a survey you uh, uh, got so very very adequate survey, very professional on the on how many people distrust them, uh, distrust uh, Israeli Britain activists, and seventy two percent of the people was opposing the activists, eighteen percent was sustaining, and ten percent was uncertain. But uh, they had more than eighty per eighty five percent of people saying okay, but their demand. Insulating, insulating houses in England 
in order to cut down uh, carbon emissions and uh, uh, destroy fossil fuel poverty is right. So most of the people say what you do is wrong, but what you say is right and how you can have some massive uh, uh, public change, a uh, change in public opinion. As a result, with only 130 people blocking motorways for two months, with a campaign with only 130 people, uh, they have obliged the government to give 13.6 billion in uh, uh, for uh, uh, improving their program for emulation because the public were, was ok with their demand. This is the point. So when you're making civil resistance, you are not searching consensus for your movement, for your practice. You are searching consensus for your specific demand. And this is what obliged the government to make something. When you have this massive change in public opinion on a specific topic. Uh, but if you go on, one year after, we have a further survey that confirms what I told you before. And I can produce this on other countries. I have, I have made, say, I made the same calculation for, for, Canada, for Canada, France, and Germany. Uh, the Guardian produces another pool in October 2022, one year after, and asks to the public, what do they think of civil disobedience for climate uh, the catastrophe? And 66 of the people support taking on violent direct action. One year after, the opinion of the public about the tactic of disrupting of the of nonviolent or pacific disruption has drastically improved because what happens is that um, the, uh, you produce a, a million of conversation millions of conversation which the people start to say hey uh, those people that block motorway are stupid but they are right and uh, after five months that they see you on television disrupting motorways what they start to say is that those people that uh, uh, disrupt motorways maybe are stupid, but the government is not doing anything. So maybe I'm not so clear. I'm not so. I'm not so sure that they are wrong. It's only true repetition that these things happen. Otherwise, it doesn't get anywhere. So I, I want to make a very clear example. This is this has been, according to me, a a, 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 a fabulous experiment. In um, uh, there was a campaign that has failed. Now it doesn't exist anymore. The project uh, has fallen down, has been destroyed uh, by the government uh, through repression. But um, in uh, Canada, uh, during the last spring, this is what happened. 100 people have blocked motorways for uh, three months, more or less, and for asking uh, uh, to to put uh, a ban on cutting all grow uh, forest in Canada. And uh, with only 100 people, they influenced the public. There was some surveys that would say that they also had 85% approval for their demand of not uh, stop cutting uh, all grow. And the result, they had private meetings with the government and they have the ban cutting on all grow uh, increased from 50% to 80% in British Columbia. Um, so, what is relevant here is uh, that uh, one year before there was a big uh, civil disobedience event uh, and so many people went to forest in you know, to a big forest in canada and uh, they climbed the trees uh, they say we block uh, um, we block the trucks uh, that want to cut down uh, the trees uh, and then the police arrived one day and arrested uh, hundreds of people in a single day but nothing happened because no one noticed on the contrary, 100 people blocking motorways and producing 85% of approval for their demands because they had the public attention and produced legislative change with many less people. So this is, for me, the key experiment to understand how civil resistance works is by disturbing the public and not by being perfect, but being scandalous by creating public opinion discussion. Um, so those are more technicalities that we won't have time now. Um, um, so uh, I will proceed. Over. Those are other more technicalities. So yes, I explain you this. Um, generally, when, when we start uh, fighting in a, in, a, <coughs> in a movement, in a general movement, of course, we are all part of something bigger, of an ecosystem of movements. What, what is important to, to see 
is more or less this diagram. Uh, please close the microphone. Um, um, is this um, low power um, diagram. This is um, made for uh, calculating the intensity of uh, social phenomenon. So let's put it very clear. If there is something up here, maybe this is terrorist. Okay, we, we are analyzing the climate movement. If someone is up here, it means this is highly intense. Okay, there is very few people doing this level of, of activities. Maybe there are terrorists here. If someone is down there, okay, maybe it's a low level activity, maybe it's collecting petitions. Okay, the climate movement or the pro democratic movement, as you are, is made by many people that have different position on this line. So the real, the, the real uh, 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 chance to make a revolution happen is to bring everyone uh, a, a, a bit closer to the vertical line. So I mean, someone is here collecting petition. You go there and you say, okay, let's start doing marches. Someone is here doing uh, uh, legal marches. You say, come here, make non-legal marches. And someone is here, you say, swarm, make swarming or start boycotting. And you say, come here, we make a roadblocks in 1000 people uh, for three hours. And you say, okay, we can also get here and you make uh, uh, blocking motorways and get arrested. So what we, uh, what we have to understand is that um, we have to understand the um, movement as an holistic stuff um, and bring it together. And one of the key determinants by a 22 network is making high level civil resistance so everyone gets arrested or gets in prison is that uh, there are many sociological proofs uh, that uh, when uh, there is no mobilization, there is no people fighting uh, seriously and in, in a very engaged way for a specific problem like climate catastrophe, uh, what uh, historically happens that brings uh, a new momentum in the movement is that some people make an uh, uh, some few people make an high level sacrifice. This creates uh, the radicalization of all the other people in this line. Because uh, if you go, on, if you have only 50 people and you are on national television, you are the biggest movement uh, according to the result. And there is this other movement, which is on the air, which is made of thousands of people and start to see you and say, oh my God, they are making more than us with only 50 people. They will start to say very probably, okay, maybe we have to radicalize a bit further. So no one thinks that uh, 100 people are enough to make a revolution. Uh, of course, we have uh, this uh, higher and uh, more holistic approach that we have to look at all the spectrum of people which is engaging in political activism in Europe and in Western countries. Right now. And uh, the main point of making a high level civil resistance campaigns is there are good chances that it creates a momentum for every people which is politically engaged to make something more um, because we are all connected some way as we are speaking here right now. And uh, the main point uh, you are speaking with me, and uh, I must be honest, is not because uh, I've studied this kind of stuff, uh, but it is because uh, we are getting arrested and this has caught public attention and so it has been brave. So this is the main reason we are talking uh, because I'm no one. I was a farmer until one year ago in my life. Okay? I'm not a sociologist, I'm not a university teacher. I'm a person that has taken bravery of entering in civil resistance uh, with other common people. So this is their main reason. And so I'm here talking with you, with other activists and trying to radicalize you explicitly. And this is something that we can make on a wider scale. So you also can make tomorrow. You can go, get out, being arrested, learn civil disobedience and teaching other people. So we all move together because we have a lot of things to do for climate catastrophe and democracy right now. Um, so what I'm going to focus on right now after the introduction, which is the main point I want to open with you before a conversation, is that I suggest you to look at uh, this video, How to Stop Climate Crisis in Six Months, made by Roger Allen. It was released from uh, prison yesterday, uh, so I'm quite happy also. It seems I love him as a person. And um, this video more or less uh, focuses on uh, what are six key designing factors in organizing civil resistance. And of course, this is all an introduction and this is the same thing I will repeat you to, new, to you today. And there's nothing of the 
the heavy lays in the detail of a structural organization. So what also I want to show you, no, this is not for this moment, this is for a climate movement, okay? Uh, sorry, this is in Italian, um, and because I had no time to, to make a translation since, as I told you, I had a big family problem tonight. Um, uh, the first thing, in organizing a civil resistance movement that uh, can have some uh, um, coherence and uh, um, logical uh, uh, strategy, strategy is um, focusing on uh, um, centralism, at least at the beginning of the project. And this sounds quite unfamiliar with our standard of, or with our common standard of horizontalism. But um, what um, has been uh, um, clear in most uh, of uh, uh, well-disciplined uh, 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 mass civil resistance movements in the history is that they were they at the beginning, and that beginning was usually made by four, six people in a room that had planned what has to do, what has to be done in the next five, ten years, usually. And they had uh, some specific idea and some specific steps, step-by-step -step strategy. So when you start uh, to make a civil resistance movement and that's to be ambitious, the first step is find four to six people that say that they want to dedicate themselves 12 hour a day to make a revolution. Otherwise, it doesn't work very simply. Why it doesn't work? First of all, uh, uh, because um, Having six people which have some executive power is necessary to keep in control every key decision. And the key decisions are who is negotiating with the government, who is making some specific, what, what do we ask to the government, when do we go to the street, and how do we use money, okay? When those four major decisions are not, uh, have not uh, someone that has the explicit power to decide, they get, uh, in a very complex situation of a big uh, dialogue uh, between uh, many people in the movement, uh, many people arguing uh, on how to use the money, when do you go to the street, uh, and then you never get to the decision. <laughs> this is the main problem very often with not having a clear executive power. Um, and the second thing is because um, we are going to face some climate collapses, 9-11, 9-11 ecological disasters. So right now in Italy, what we are seriously seeing is that we will have drugs and we will out of water probably before the summer or at the middle of the summer. What will happen is that many people will suffer. And what will happen when many people will suffer is that uh, we will have to take the street as soon as possible. And uh, so you have to have, uh, you need to have six people that can take a fast decision like uh, tomorrow, uh, four other farmers die from starvation in Sicily, and uh, all, all the nation is talking, is, taking, is talking about this. You cannot take three months to make a decision. You have to make a decision in one day. Okay, we have to go to the parliament and block the parliament. If you wait three months, because you have a very democratic complex process, you have lost the chance to have a, to have a win, very simply. So this is the key designing factor. You have to take six person that build a project, that build a strategy, that design a project and trust them. Otherwise, you will never take the chances and opportunity and you will never take massive risk because we all have seen this in our, in our experience of activism. So someone is saying, okay, we have to make something strong and we have to take risk. And then it gets to an assembly made of 50 people and the assembly will water down the ambitious people usually because we all have brands opinion and someone is as core integrity, moral integrity and dedication to a revolution and someone has not very simply. And we all have to enter in service to each other. We have to trust each other. And we have to trust some guides if you want to go out of this. So uh, some six, four, six, eight people that are at the core of the executive uh, main decision can guarantee moral integrity to the project, can take massive risk, can take chances, and can uh, uh, create a culture of hard working. So I can never stress how much difficult it is, how much difficult it is. So we are very close to, we are very used to volunteering into, into the movements, but um, what it is extremely, 
important is uh, uh, that uh, without people that work 10 to 12 hour days, uh, the things will never work as fast enough because uh, revolution processes in nonviolence are fast processes. So uh, things happen uh, uh, very, very fast. Um, um, and uh, without people that uh, are up there understanding what is happening, things will not move fast. Then uh, uh, six, eight people can create a, a strategic coherence that makes logical sense. And, uh, and moreover, they can create a leaderful system. So what does it mean? This is not a full hierarchical vision of how an organization may work. It is the opposite. But we came out of the idea of no one is, uh, and this movement has no leaders, but we have created full opposite. This movement full of leaders. So when there are six people that work 12 hour day, that everyone knows they are good people that work hard, and everyone is inspired by them, those people will go to many other people that are mobilized and will teach them how to become leaders and become leaders in their own space of organization. So it is the idea of putting together functional hierarchy and an holocratic organization. So what is extremely relevant is that we divide ourselves for different functions. So, and we have a very, very complex system of organization with people which is uh, communicating to each other. So I make an example. These blue things up here is the core strategic team, okay? Those are six people that start the project, fund the project and search for the money for the project. And um, those are connected one by one to the communication team. Here there is people that make in the press and they are only working with the press team and the social team. They are not making anything else. And here is the people which is uh, expanding. So they are going around uh, the country and uh, searching to create local chapters all around. And those are connected with the people that organize actions. And the people that organize action decide that we make 10 action a day, 10 action a month. And it goes to every local chapter. They say, you make one, you make two, you make one, you make two. And uh, this is a way of... Um, adding many decisions to be taken in many different places so that there is a direct democracy and uh, people in those groups are eight and people and make uh, and take responsibility, take important decision. But at the same time, there is not the total full horizontalism that usually brings to very slow movements, which are ineffective because maybe they engage in absolutely democratic uh, uh, processes of six months to make a decision, but the, the, the work is changing that right there, outside there, and is changing very fast in a very scary way. So um, the second thing which is extremely relevant is more or less um, the story I told you before about uh, the Sicilian farmers that start that summer, and maybe we have to take the street immediately. So many sociologists in uh, efficient uh, um, civil resistant movement have emphasized two things. Uh, maybe they take a lot of time in order to be organized, but then as soon as they start to gain momentum, they are fast and furious. Six months, one year. And if it doesn't work in six months, one year, you have to start back because you have lost the emotional engagement of the public and of the people who are mobilizing. That doesn't last long here, usually. So um, I will make an example here. This is the story, of, a perfect example. This is the story of freedom riders. So this is one of the major episodes uh, of the civil rights movements campaigns from 1955 to 1964. Um, so we have some background factors uh, to understand. Uh, since 1958, uh, the civil rights movement was bad, was in a very bad situation. So in 1955, there is the Montgomery bus boycott. Rosa Parks get arrested and. Uh, a uh, dozen of thousands of people start boycotting buses in Montgomery. And uh, then you have uh, Martin Luther King becoming the leader of the civil rights movement. And then um, you have some um, three years of very active uh, um, civil rights activism with many wins, with many legislative changes, one after the other. But then uh, what happened is that uh, repression goes up. Cuckoo's and uh, uh, expands uh, and they start beating uh, black people and being very aggressive. And so many people start to be afraid and they stop doing activism. So from 58 to 61, 
the situation is bad. There is a lot of discussion, there is a lot of uh, assemblies, but nothing's happened in the street. Then in 1961, some people make a very brave decision, which is not based on nothing, which is based on the old uh, school uh, tradition of the freedom ride. So it, is not, it was something that they have recovered from 1945. And they decide to take a bus in order to travel uh, toward the south of uh, the US and to challenge the segregation system. So they cross several states. When they arrive to the inter interstate uh, uh, bus station, they go down from the bus, they enter in the bathroom, they enter in the canteen, which are segregated, and they say, we are black people that want to see with white people in the, in the canteen. And uh, what happened is very interesting. Since uh, uh, the South and the interstate uh, uh, port in the South of the US was already desegregated according to the uh, constitution of the uh, US in 1942. But in the South of the US, there was the way of living of South. So if someone black uh, and was entering a white canteen, even if it was completely legal, it was probably beaten up, arrested, and jailed. So what they did, 13 very brave people started from the center of US. They jumped on a bus, on a Greyhound bus, and they went down, crossing every street. And uh, they didn't stop at the first state when they were arrested. They didn't stop at the second state. They have crossed 10th state, and they went to fucking Alabama in the heart of darkness. And what happened there is that they have been drastically beaten up, their bus has been fired, and they all have gone to hospital. And when they have gone out of hospital, they have been put into prison, okay? So it was a dramatic thing made by all these 13 people. What happened next is that three days after, people were starting again, and 470 people have been arrested from Freedom Riders in three months, and they had the win. So this is the win. Uh, Kennedy has uh, put the federal government, the federal army of the US to go in the south of the US uh, and oblige them to accept black people in the, in the white country and in the white uh, uh, train station. And, uh, and the, he, he forced the law. Why did it happen? There is a question of timing, which is extremely relevant that many sociologists have pointed out that uh, uh, Kennedy, that year, was going to have um, a, a tour of Western countries. There was the Cold War, and Kennedy, Kennedy was going around uh, saying that he was the leader of the free world, that uh, it was uh, the, bad, the good side of history and the Russia was bad. And uh, it was not very good uh, that he was saying that he was the leader of the free world, and at the same time, newspaper all over the world was full of people, of black people that was beaten up and sent to prison only because they wanted to sit with white males in canteens or like that. So they have choosing a perfect timing to make a, a, a maximally explicit the hypocrisy of the US and to oblige Kennedy to make something in order to save face for the international opinion. So we can have this timing, okay? If we, when we, when we start a campaign, we can organize this timing or we can have a, a strong leadership which is able to take opportunities when the right timings comes out from uh, the running of events. And this is something which is extremely relevant as a core factor of organizing. The third thing which is extremely relevant and without this, uh, everything else won't work is that um, we have a more or less analyzed that, as I told you before, in the last 30, 40 years, um, the movements have been uh, uh, general, um, very um, abstract in setting up their goals, in setting their goals. So maybe we want direct democracy, or we want a revolution, or we want uh, the climate justice. And this is what we communicate to the general public. And usually it doesn't work. Why it doesn't work? Uh, because you don't create uh, momentum uh, into the people. So um, what, I, what we think it works more 
is um, is the approach that uh, of classical civil disobedience that it was um, what Martin Luther King did, what Gandhi did, what ACT UP, Larry Kramer did in order to save millions of people from I from IDS. So they had some specific demand to the government, which was very clear, and they tried to add legislative change after legislative change, one after the other, in order to create momentum and to bring people to the wider goal. For instance, the wider goal of uh, last generation is direct democracy through citizen assembly. But we are 100 people right now blocking roads. Okay, we are going to be 100 people. We can't ask the total revolution with 100 people. But and if you and but uh, what we have to do in order to grow is gain victories. So we have to put the topics, the big agenda, step by step. Otherwise, after six months, eight months, you have make no advantages. You have gained nothing and people will get home and they will be depressed. So uh, as with Insulate Britain, uh, it's very clear. Insulate Britain demands uh, was uh, 120, 150 people blocking motorways. And they asked the government to start, pub, to start home insulating starting from public houses, from the popular houses. And uh, they were extremely successful. And one of the reasons why it was extremely successful, it was a social demand, okay? It was not only about climate change, it was about uh, fuel poverty, it was, some, it was about the money of the people, okay? Second thing, it was a winnable demand, okay? It was something, it was not asking uh, from the end of climate change or, or um, from here to tomorrow. It was something the government could actually do. And uh, it was something also that was interesting for the electoral authorities that were quite interesting in those topics because those are usually poor people from the north of England, um, uh, from, from the north of England, and they have cold houses. So that was interesting for the electors of the government. And, uh, and uh, moreover, it was a violation from the government which had promised to increase the plan in order of home insulating. So when there was there, uh, they were there blocking motorways, they were not only violating the law, they were violating the law for highlighting that the government was violating the law, exactly as the freedom riders. They were right to go into the white male canteen and they, it was completely legal. So, um, so one other point which is classical in civil disobedience is that uh, try to see what the government has promised to do and is not doing and point it out as clear as possible. And it is extremely, extremely, extremely relevant. So there is a clear concept, which is called declare victory and run. So what does it mean? It means that uh, you have to win something. It doesn't mean if it is little, you have to have uh, some uh, negotiation with the government or with the institution and to gain something. Because then you go to the people and you say, hey, we had this. Uh, now we make a further step and we go over and people will be full of enthusiasm and you will, and your organization will gain uh, credibility and your leadership will gain credibility. And this will bring a closer community of people that trust each other and really feel that can try to make something big step by step, but fast as, pos as fast as possible at the same time, because we have not that much time in order to bring a direct democracy um, into, this, uh, uh, into this tragic situation of climate collapse and social collapse we are in. Um, so this is extremely, extremely relevant. And uh, this is the classic approach. So Gandhi never asked for uh, um, the, the end of the British Empire in India, never asked for that directly. Uh, Martin Luther King never asked for the end of all the laws of flash armed segregation in one step, but they were making specific progress, progress and at every progress they were creating further momentum and further mobilization. So stop with the bus boycott, stop with the, the segregation in canteen, the rise, the campaign for the vote registration, the campaign of Birmingham against the, uh, uh, the against jailing minor people of black colors and every campaign has a specific target in order to make procedures and steps over. So the last things which is very important 
the four thing, which is very important. And then I will open to a QA and an open dialogue, which I think which is more fruitful than what I'm doing here, is that um, many people often in the activism space uh, does not connect okay, of a systematic principle. So um, uh, the idea maybe some there is some action guys that want to go to the street, uh, that want to make a lot of flyering. There is some analytic guys that want to make a lot uh, of organization and planning. But the point is that you cannot uh, make things uh, uh, separated, okay? This is the main thing. So usually this is a cycle of momentum of how a momentum driven organization works. So as soon as you have three people, get out in the street. Otherwise you will never make it. Uh, as I told you, uh, three years ago, I did it alone because no one was taking action in Italy for climate change in a civil disobedience methodology. And so you make, you go into the street with few people, you make an escalation, you make nonviolent action, you gain the attention. Uh, so you have a specific demand which is intelligent and people will call you to television or will call you to the local assemblies of other movement and will tell you, hey, we agree with what you're doing. And you say, okay, but I want to create a, a very fast and furious movement. So who's going to enter? And uh, you, uh, 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 you, you absorb people and uh, you can reiterate this project and this cycle as many times as possible. In, if you have a national project, you can make three, four times a year this project. This is what A22 did last year. Now we are slower because we are working with higher numbers and it is more difficult. But at the beginning, we have created four, six, uh, in some countries, major moment of disruption to the public in order to create organization. And in some countries, like in Italy, we started with five people blocking highways in for nine times in 11 days. It was the beginning, five people, no one noticed, but it was enough for going on. So one of the main, main confusion about... Um, creating an organization in the civil resistance framework is that uh, many people think, uh, uh, okay, I will do civil resilience, civil disobedience when will be 10,000. And then nothing happens. So it is quite the contrary. Uh, it is quite the contrary we are seeing is that uh, when you have three, five people and they start doing actions, then you repeat and you will have six, nine people. And then you repeat and you will have an higher number again. And through this cycle of iteration, you create uh, the process uh, of mobilization. And, um, but of course, we have to look at a lot of micro details. So one of the main problem is that, uh, of course, if you, if you are three people, you get in prison and you go home and you don't, you don't make mobilization, it doesn't work, okay? So the point is that uh, you have also seven people, you bring them to the street, uh, they get arrested, they get to prison for two weeks, uh, maybe. And when they come back, when they come back, you have already a team that has organized them to make a tour in all of your nation and go around and say, hey, come to get arrested with me. And so you have, or you have a team that organized tours and makes speeches, public speeches all around. So this is more or less the idea of a nonlinear regression that comes from uh, uh, sociological studies made by Roger Allen. So this is, um, this is um, uh, an idea of progression. So upstairs, you have um, in the upper framework, you have people getting arrested for a civil disobedience action. So you have five people getting arrested here, 20 people, 60 people. And you don't have all it to do. High level civil resistance, only people getting arrested. You can also bring something different. You can also maybe ask people to make a march or collecting petition for the same topic. So you can be more inclusive, you can have more people. And what you see here is that four or five people arrested, maybe there are 10 people collecting petition. For 20 people arrested, there are 50 people collecting petition. And for 60 people arrested, you have 200 people collecting petition. And all, this, all of this is something you can create in a row, okay? So let's make us an example for TN25. You know? Uh, you make uh, something in the direction of our, our direct democracy in a specific city. And so there is people that is going to paint and you ask for having open council. So people need to have transparency of what happens in the council of the city because there is no transparency. 
and there have to be one day a week into which the public can enter in the council and hear what the people say about some okay. important deliberation. So five people got to, to, to put, uh, to throw painting on the council, okay? And 10 people collect petition. Then you repeat uh, two weeks after, okay? And then you have created momentum and you have 20 people that want to throw painting on the council and 50 collecting petition. And then you have 60 when you repeat one month later because you have created more bravery in more people and you have 200 collecting petition. And then you will start to have a, legal, a, a, a negotiation with the local council or with the local government. So the idea is that action creates mobilization. Is there something that we are confirming other way around in different countries in Europe? And of course, there are many ways of designing it. Um, I get further, I get further. There is a fifth principle, which is the proximity, which is absolutely necessary in whatever you do. I, I was, uh, because there was someone for, um, there was someone from your organization that had written on a blog uh, a very in a very intelligent uh, uh, article about one of our actions, and he per because he perfectly got this point from a, from an, an external observer. So what uh, he said, for instance, was that uh, there was the there was a, a, an art action in the museum um, and uh, that had an enormous coverage. Global, so it went to US, it went to Russia, Russia, it went to many countries. And uh, what he noticed is that uh, uh, as soon as you enter it in our website, and uh, there was a link very big with written come to meet us, and there was a, a online meeting three days after the actions. Okay, and uh, what does it mean? It means that when you try to get the attention of the people, you have a very limited frame time in order to concretize into mobilization. And what mobilization, I simply mean people doing things, okay? So I mean that someone comes to the meetings and gets into the street in three weeks and get arrested or otherwise enters in an organization teams or it becomes a leafleter and it goes into the city sending out leaflets for last generation. Concretizing with mobilization, I mean people doing things. Um, when you maybe have a meeting or you see an action, your time framework of attention of, yes, I also want to do this, uh, usually is very limited, two, three days maximum. And then you forget and you start to think again to your daily life. So you have to create uh, as many steps as possible in order to bring the people to you because it's very difficult. So I make an example. You rent a room uh, in the local uh, council and you are making a direct democracy uh, campaign. So you make a very emotional speech. You, you bring no, you don't make a conference for intellectuals. You make a very, very concrete emotional speech into which you say to the people of your town, uh, we are fuck up with this corruption. We want to resist this corruption. We look up for his children and uh, his lovers come up. We have to resist, okay? Something like that, okay? And then you collect the phone numbers of all the people, of course because you have to stay in contact with them and you have to keep contact with those people, and which is extremely relevant. And then you have to call, call, phone call them in less time as possible, like 24 hours, 48 hours, in order to ask them to make something more. So, hey, it was nice yesterday. Can you come to the training for nonviolent direct action? Can you come to, lead, to have a leafleting with me in, in the center of the city. And we, we have a team of 10 people leafleting in the center of the city and we are going to leaflet. Um, or uh, are, you, are you willing to take the street in weeks from now? So you have to contact the people like, and to always have a second option of what they can do. So the perf design, for instance, is that you make a public speech and you say people about... Uh, I don't know, direct democracy campaign, climate crisis campaign. And when you go there, you already have the leaflets for the next meeting. So you have already rented the meeting next week in another room in the same city, and you already have the leaflets in order to advertise. And you say to the people at the end of the speeches, hey, who wants to come to help me to give the leaflets so the next time we have more people to talk about the climate crisis? And most of the people will tell you yes, because uh, it's a psychological game, okay? You are up there, you've been arrested, maybe you are, you, you are 
semi-public famous, so you have been in television discussing with politician, and you are you they know you have made something brave, and you are simply asking them, asking them to give leaflets. 90% of the people say yes. We, we, we will see you tomorrow evening and we will give leaflets together. And this is happening only because you have calculated everything to be as fast as possible. Because if you wait one week to call back the people, what happens is that most of them will have lost all of the emotion they had connected to your speech or the idea of making nonviolent resistance for kind of democracy or social justice or whatever. So, uh, the perfect, the perfect design, and it is very difficult to do, is that uh, when people come to the meeting, you call them back in 48 hours. In uh, one week, she's in a non-violence direct action training, and in less than three weeks, uh, she's get arrested. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we've been very much faster than this. Usually, we are not that good. Okay, this is the perfect design principle in order to bring people to the street because. Uh, if they wait too much, they will lose the idea of doing it. This is quite important. This is the principle of proximity, is something which is um, absolutely general. You can use it for everything you do. So you can use it for, uh, um, for uh, sending people online to your meeting. So where do I put the link in order to subscribe to the Zoom meeting for the Sunday evening public speech online? It is at the beginning of the website. It is at the beginning of the social post of uh, uh, the daily uh, roadblock has been done. Da, 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 da. Whatever you do, one of the main principles is asking yourself, um, how do we do it? Um, and how do we maximize the proximity in temporal terms and in geographical terms in order to facilitate the participation of the people? So this is a question of how do we facilitate the, the, the participation of the people? And it is a very pragmatic answer. You have to cut down the, times, the time frame between the first step, the second step, the third step, usually. Last things, and then we can really get to the dialogue, is mass mobilization. So no way that will achieve uh, important victories without uh, making a lot of public speech uh, and uh, moving around the countries uh, and trying to tell to as many people as possible that they have to enter in civil resistance. But uh, there is also a way that we will have a mass mobilization if we wait uh, to be 10,000 before starting doing actions because it doesn't, it doesn't create emotions, it doesn't create, uh, it doesn't create a change in public. So, um, what we do in the A22 network is more or less using this uh, ideal model. Of course, this is an ideal model of three phases revolution. It will never happen in three phases, of course. This is an ideal model. The real world is much more difficult than this. And we have a lot of uh, failings. We have a lot of uh, going back, uh, regression, uh, failing again, trying again. It's much more difficult, but more or less having a general model helps you to move into reality. So the idea more or less is that as soon as you have seven people willing to be arrested, you have to go out there and make civil resistance, not for one day, for two weeks continuously, also with seven people. Why? Because this is the only way that you will get the attention, at least of regional newspaper and some national news. Okay. This is the only way that you will have this level of attention with the number of people by increasing your resistance for a time frame of two weeks. And through this phase, you also create a community of people who will be really committed to, to go on in their life. Why? Well, because they are fuck, okay? Because they have so many legal problems after doing this that they have to go on <laughs> anyway, because it makes no sense stopping when you make something so, so drastic. And uh, in this phase, uh, more or less, uh, you only need one Zoom link well publicized on social media and on the internet in order to have an higher mobilization that could reach five, 50, 000, uh, 50 to 200 people, of course. And um, 
this is uh, this is something that you need okay and many project most of the project have reached at least 50 people and have gone to the second phase almost have most of the project of the ATM edition network uh, at the second phase when you have 50 people in the street for one month one month and a an half of continuous civil resistance usually you start to see some small legislative change some sort of partial victories uh, with your demand and you this is enough 50 people for a month for being uh, uh, the the movement of the here in your country okay so the most popular movement the most well known the most well publicized the the one that goes to the television and to the talk show the radical uh, with the with the with the right wing uh, talk show and to to argue with politicians television and with only 50 people to others in order to get here to phase 3 you in order to 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 get to phase 2 you have make five to 10 face-to-face -face meetings in your nation for weeks. So you have to organize five to 10 people that uh, move around uh, into the, your nation and go and uh, uh, into uh, some rooms that have been waiting and the public gets on and they say, we have to get arrested, the signer, and you collect the phone numbers of the people and you call them again in order to see if they are willing to make civil resistance. And then no one has reached phase three yet. I think that Germany, next generation Germany is quite close to there because they are working very good. They are incredible. And uh, 2,000 uh, people, 10,000 people that are doing high levels of resistance should be enough to put, the, to put the government into a crisis and to oblige them to a direct negotiation and to agree fully to a dilemma demand. And uh, I think that the Germans are, have quite good chances of getting there in the next three, four months at the moment, um, according to the data they are producing. And they are actually doing from 20 to 40 public meetings in Germany per week. So this is a massive operation, this is a massive organization of public meetings. So they talk with almost 1,000 people per week face to face. Um, of course, they are, they are much better than me at organizing. I should say that you have to talk with them if you want to learn more because really there is no comparison from their level to my level. Okay? Those are incredible activists, uh, incredible people. And, um, but yes, this is more or less, this is more of a model. I try to rephrase it and resume it very soon, very fast. So the point is, uh, more or less, uh, is that uh, six, ten, six, eight people have to take the major decision, which is uh, what do we ask the government, which is the general strategy, and how do we use money, and when do we get to the streets? Otherwise, it will never happen that we will take massive risk through a collective decision of 50 people. And those people are, uh, are starting the project and say to the people that want to jump on the project, Okay, this is the project. Uh, we are here to make resistance because we're fuck. If you don't like it, you can go somewhere else. Okay, you don't have to make a super discussion. We have to be pragmatic and work hard. Second time is the time frame. So uh, to understand that there are some major chances when there are some shocking events happening, uh, like uh, hundreds of uh, CC farmers dying from starvation because uh, uh, there is a, a, a food collapse in Italy, it's something that could happen this summer, and uh, you have to take the street immediately and to take that, pay, do that frame. Third thing is that we have to make some specific demands and to gain as much victories, small victory, partial victories, or full victories as possible in order to create uh, the willingness of the people to accept civil resistance. Um, the third thing is that uh, as soon as you get three people get out in the street, uh, if you want to start, otherwise you will never start, very probably. The fourth thing is, uh, let's try to maximize the time framework from one passage to the other. So if one person comes to the meeting and wants to enter in the M25, a civil resistance, I don't know, for, you, for what, something that maybe you, you will call uh, resistance 25, I don't know, and this is your movement, is uh, you don't have to wait one month before asking to have to do something. You will make something with the new people in three days. So these people will feel that uh, she's integrated, she's activated, 
in a new community and she likes this community because people wants to be integrated and want to make a three hours discussion, wants to make things useful. And the last thing is that uh, we have to engage in creating as many public meetings as possible in order to be an open group, a group that is always uh, taking new people in, uh, that is not, does not become a close group of few people that know each other and don't open the space. So we have to keep the space open and make as many public meetings as possible. So those are more or less the key element of the eight networks, so just a point, next generation, ultima generation, dernière innovation, and other movements around Europe. Um, it's never enough. I, I've done, so I will go to the Q&A space. Uh, many things, what I tell you is highly imperfect. It's only one year that I'm doing these things in my life. I'm not a sociologist. I, I was a farmer one year ago, and, uh, and uh, there are many things that you can improve on what I told you, and I'm sure that many of you has relevant experiences. But according to me, what I told you is not relevant because uh, many of the people that now see this to an high level, to a much higher level than me, uh, um, have, first of all, uh, an emotional engagement, which is extremely relevant of their intellectual engagement. So they have started to make civil disobedience because it was right, not because it was a right strategy, not because it was a good strategy. And this is what is distinguishing most of the people that are doing high level civil resistance in Europe in the moment. Most of them, they do it because it's right, not because they have made a logical calculation on what is historically worth or not. And so I pass it to you if there are some question and answer space. And I'm really happy of you listening so so long because I think it was so was boring, maybe. <laughs> so thank you. Many thanks, Michele. Sorry that I missed uh, the beginning. I had another meeting, as I told you, but it's nice to see you again. And we are so glad that you gave this presentation. It is incredibly valuable, really. And we truly appreciate it. It was not boring at all. I see people are already writing that in the in the chat. And thank you all for staying with us, of course, uh, dear DMers. Uh, for those who, of you who don't know me, I'm campaigning coordinator of DM25. And as Michaela said, now we would like to hear from you. If you have any question, please uh, put your hand above. But in the emoticon, in the area of the Zoom. So you go to reactions and then raise hand because otherwise it, it, there is a possibility we won't see you because there's many of you. I see there's already two raised hands. So first, uh, let me give the word to Yelena and then Elaine. Sorry, Yelena, you're muted. I should have learned. I'm so sorry about this. I wanted to thank uh, again uh, for this amazing opportunity to be taught very practical principles. And it sounds very plausible and I'm very excited. Uh, but I have, uh, of course, doubts uh, or questions or dilemmas. Yeah. And the first question is about the core group. Uh, Mikhail mentioned that it has to be a group of six very dedicated people. And how do you find this group of six dedicated people? Who is willing? to, for example, sacrifice their work or whatever duties they have in order to fully commit to this uh, campaign with very uncertain outcomes. So how you find this hardcore group? And a follow-up question to that is how this group then make a living? So this is connected to also uh, how we finance them because it's a hard work. Mikhail mentioned 12 hours a day, I agree. So this is my doubt and also when you try to <clears throat> recruit other people, they also have maybe difficulties to agree to be arrested, for example, because if you are arrested, you cannot have a, a job of a teacher anymore, for example. So, you know, like, I guess you have to be very lucky, but I don't know how to convince people to sacrifice. That's my dilemma. Thanks. Yeah, enormous. Just a reminder, thank you much. So <clears throat> we are in a difficult financial situation right now, uh, this is uh, the link. Um, I think that a university teacher can like ask 1,000 euro, 100 euro for making a CV resistance speech about what they read in books and not making life. So like, uh, 
if you have appreciated for me, five, 10 euros uh, uh, are very good. And this is the link for donation for last generation Italy, because we are also in a deep economic situation. So about uh, creating a core team uh, is, I, I don't have a, a, an absolute uh, answer. I think there are many ways of life. Um, I can tell you my way of life was quite easy. So all of the main core team of Fate Edition Network is people that has gone out of XR, Extinction Rebellion. So it was quite easy. So the people I started with was people I knew since months or years. And we were all frustrated the same way with Extinction Rebellion. And so we all made uh, this decision because uh, we have seen uh, some Roger Allen videos and we have talked to Roger Allen and he told us, okay, you have two options. Is option one is you go to your movement and say, okay, you want to make uh, a civil resistance because we are in a very difficult situation and you have two months in order to answer. If yes, we all agree as a movement, if not, uh, you ask to the people that want to go out and you go out and you create something new. So what it happens more often historically is that this kind of new vanguard movements arise from people that knew each other from larger movements. And so you create a smaller movement into a larger movement. So this is what happens more often historically. So the Freedom Riders was 13 people at the beginning, but they were not like the Freedom Riders. They were part of the larger civil movements that was not working. It was dysfunctional. It was not producing action and change anymore. But the second thing is how do you how do you uh, do, do you convince people to make um, civil resistance? Of course, I don't want to give an absolute answer because here there is some people that came also from I think some uh, country which are less uh, uh, privileged than the country I'm from. So uh, I don't want to see you high it's easy. It's not easy. Okay, it depends on the context. I cannot give you an absolute answer. For some people, it's very difficult. Uh, so I can only speak for myself or for my case in Italy, into which the level of repression is not that high, as people say, in my point of view. So it depends on the on how you see things. So, but the main frame of creating a, a civil resistance is setting up the example. So it's not about convincing people. It's about getting out, going out, being arrested, and talk to your friend about your experience without trying to be bully. Okay without trying to make this a macho thing. It's not a macho thing. It's like, I've done it because I thought it was right and I'm worried about the future. And this is much more convincing. You don't have to convince people rationally. It doesn't work, absolutely. It's like you have to set an example. And uh, if you have a, a good social intelligence, so you have connected to many people, this will create new people that want to step up. And um, they told you, I, I did this alone in Italy two years ago, and no one knows it. <laughs> and, um, and it took two years before making this decision. Okay, now I see that comes and make this decision in one week, because the more people take bravery, the more it becomes faster, the process. It's difficult for the first people setting the example. This is very difficult because you're here to make the decision to put yourself at risk. But then if, if you start, it's easier. Uh, I go faster. What do we have to do, in my opinion, in the, in the A22 network design is that we don't have to rationalize civil resistance. It was, it was hilarious. I, I went to one of the director of Amnesty International and they told me they are writing a two, year, these two years, they are writing a constitution on how to make civil disobedience because maybe they will deliberate one day to make civil disobedience. <laughs> this is not the way it works. Uh, people in the South, the global South, make civil resistance because they are fuck and they are full of uh, rage and emotion. So, one of the things we have to design is that uh, we have to take normal people, not intellectuals, to make the speeches. We have to bring out uh, mothers, children, guys and give them a script from a very emotional speech and to send them how to make the speeches. Because as soon as you rationalize and try to convince them to make it because there are good chances more than making a petition, this is not the way it works. People do not get convinced by rationalization. And the best things people get convinced to is uh, you have to set up the sample. So you have to make it before the other people and you have to be humble. You don't have to bully people. You have to say, oh, I did it because I think it's important uh, and uh, 
I'm frustrated uh, with the situation and you emotionally engage with people. This is the best way, according to my opinion. And thank you, because it was very, very important. This is the most important thing as I try. I cannot overstress how much this is the most important thing. Yeah, I, I just didn't get the answer. How do you pay the bills in the meantime? <laughs> you have to grow fund. You have to grow fund. It's mm -hmm. difficult. You have to grow fund. Uh, I live uh, with very few money, and you have to accept that uh, you you can live with very few money, and you need the help from friends, and you create community many ways. But well, there that... is an absolute answer. This is the biggest problem. I thought this is the. Well, I, I bow to you, Mikel. You are like a saint. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks both. Uh, the next uh, one is Alain. Sorry if I'm in, mispronouncing your name. Don't worry, I also mispronounce my own name. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. It's very practical. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I had one question. So you mentioned um, doing small uh, actions uh, and winning small victories so that people can feel uh, empowered and um, they can join and participate in bigger actions and we build something, we snowball something up. So I understand this, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, my question is, when we are fighting uh, small fights that we know do not make a real difference, and in DiEM we speak of uh, revolutionary concepts like uh, democratizing Europe, democratizing the economy, uh, taking it back from the bankers, the oligarchs. It's we're talking about a radical change, not just improving the situation. But at the same time, to convince people that we need radical change and not just uh, small changes, um, sometimes it's good for the situation not to be good. And yani the crisis are good because they allow people to see that a big change is needed. So how do we balance this? How do we um, focus on small victories without making people feel that all we need is just to win 10 small victories and have a few more improvements? Uh, and then that's it. We don't need to have a radical change. That's an enormous question. And it like would happen like another meeting, but um, I can give you my idea very fast. I think it's very relevant what you say. Um, it depends on uh, um, on keeping the balance in the framing. So like when I make the Gandhi example, Gandhi has always been explicitly clear that he wanted to, to send away the British Empire. At the same time, he was focusing on step by step. So he was focusing on the South March. So we want to bring out the monopoly of the South. We want to have the Indian South and we want to use it. Uh, he made a lot of working class uh, fight. And he made a lot of uh, um, fights for the improvements of the income of uh, workers in uh, factories. Um, so he made a lot of specific steps, but it was always clear about what was the biggest problem. And the biggest problem was the British Empire. So in his rhetoric, it was always clear about the big problem. It was not, uh, it was not uh, minimizing the problems at all, but it was focusing in the action strategy on specific targets. So yes, you have to keep the frame open on uh, the biggest problem. The biggest problem is capitalism. And uh, uh, in the way we understand it right now, it is the lack of democracy in Western institutions, that, 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 which is the biggest problem. You have to communicate, but also let people and uh, let people step, uh, work step by step. Because what we will see right now, I think, uh, and we have to talk a lot about this, is the general framework is that the uh, 2020s is the year of consequences about, about climate collapse. So uh, what we all know is that uh, we passed 1.5 uh, be, probably before 2030, and we will pass two degrees before 2050, and we have 50% 50 50 of chances to, crowd, to pass two degrees before 2050. So in countries like Italy, we will have mass disaster this year. So what you have to do is that uh, 
in my opinion, in some countries like in Italy, uh, uh, revolutionary episodes are inevitable. Uh, they can be violent and fascist, or they can be uh, non-violent and pro-democratic. This is the point. But they will happen anyway because people will start to have some serious economic problem, and some people will start death, and they will get angry. So the point of trying to have some uh, small victories right now and to create some uh, some uh, confidence, civil resistance, non-binary civil resistance and create some confidence in pro-democratic movements uh, is that uh, when people will get to the street and they will furious because they have lost their crops, uh, they will have an example of something which that works uh, and they, that will, will increase the chances that they uh, will take a pro-social and non-violent approach instead of a non-social, anti-social and violent approach. This will increase the chances because if you have gained some result and you can tell them, this will increase the chances that they will trust you. And in some countries like Italy, North Europe is going much better. Greece, we are facing some ecological disaster in the next seven years. So we have to be ready. Um, so yes, of course, we are talking about making a revolution. It's only that uh, you have to grasp the moment. In order to grasp the moment, you have to build some credibility on your, on your strategy before. Otherwise, no one. If, if you have say, ah, we are making the revolution, uh, putting down the government and, and make a new democratic constitution, and you have 100 people in the street, uh, and after six months, nothing happens, you won't have gained credibility for when the moment is coming. Um, if you have uh, made some specific demand and you have won something, you will have made credibility. And of course, your real goal is having a real democracy instead of. Uh, is very corrupted government we have in the Western society. Um, so yes, you have to, to be specific on the target and also being uh, wide on the framework. Of course, you have to tell people that the problem is bigger than the specific change of legislation you're asking. Otherwise, they will never understand. I agree with you. That. Thank you very much. First, Joel, then I have one small question. OK. Uh, so, so great. It was so good. I learned so much. Um, my question is around complexities around choosing a first focus or a first demand. Um, I think even country, I'm in the United States, country to country, I feel like it could be different. I would be very curious on your thoughts. Um, just to illustrate a complexity, maybe some people, of course, are in this world, live emergency to emergency, material hardships, food scarcity, you know, and um, there are some people where I think sort of this talking of future climate change is often, I know it's, I know it's intertwined, but it, it sounds like these people long from now, we got to, you see what I mean? There's this, um, some people see it as a, a demand that is focused on climate change for some can feel future and, and maybe their life is day-to-day -day emergency, you know? I, I guess I'm just really interested in your thoughts on how one, one might decide, you know, do you, do you, um, you do a the news the news trends something rises up, and there can be moments. You know, do you? Uh, of course, I'm just curious your thoughts on how one might choose a first demand with regard to everything you said. You know, I know it's not simple. If if that makes sense. You know, it makes perfectly sense. In my case, our first demand we did was a shit. Uh, very very. <laughs> like like I, I, we we made a lot of mistakes on this point. But I'm uh, also happy that we did, otherwise we never started. So, um, so first of all, I, I want you to put the max anxiety if you want to start, because uh, to make mistakes is the best way as possible. And here is my email. If someone wants to start some project in the A22 network, uh, uh, just write me and I put it again. Um, so um, according to what you say is right, what, we, what they told you is that we are trying to have uh, a um, social justice demand, which are extremely connected to climate crisis, but we are trying to communicate the social justice aspect stronger than the climate justice aspect, because yes, the wider public does not understand. So in order, for instance, if you look to insulate Britain, which was for me a very successful example with very few people, according to what they reach, they were talking about insulation of homes in Britain, because uh, in Britain it is that the, it is the 20% of carbon emissions, but at the same time, uh, there are really millions of people that, uh, um, that have some, uh, that have cold because their houses are extremely cold 
everyone that has lived in England knows uh, that there are some problems with houses uh, which are extremely relevant. And moreover, it was, it was very intelligent because um, many of the electors of the Tories uh, government uh, are from uh, uh, are poor people, uh, working class uh, from the north of England, and there the houses are even worse. Uh, and so when they were to television, they were first talking about the social aspect, the uh, justice aspect, and it was a very simple frame. So we don't want people to die, uh, to die for cold this winter. You are killing people for cold this winter. Give money to people to have better houses. And then there is also the problem of climate crisis and we can cut down emissions, okay? So this is the framework. What we are doing in Italy right now is that we have just changed the demand. Uh, we are calling ourselves now, we don't pay fossil fuels and we are uh, targeting the public subsidies to fossil fuels. So when we go to television, we say, why the poor people as me has to pay for the fossil fuels uh, industry with this public money from taxation, okay? And this is the first time, topic. Then we also speak about how bad the situation is with the climate crisis as a second topic. So let's choose uh, um, a social topic as much as possible. This is the best idea as far as I see. Then there are some other ideas. The Germans are making a very climate change topics uh, and it is very small and winnable because it is embarrassing for the government. Uh, mm, so I don't think it works with the white public. I think it's very winnable. So there are different factors. Maybe some, uh, some demands are very good to make a, a good public impression, they have a lot of followers, but are not good because they are too big to be one with the, the, the quantity of people you really have. Uh, I don't know what is right, what is wrong. I think that at this moment, the best idea is maximizing the public attention, even if you don't win the negotiation with the government. This is my opinion. But uh, someone else, which is also, I might, the Germans are three times better than me, of course. They are making an extremist war, extremely big work. They are doing a different choice. So I don't know. I don't know. There are many factors right. to consider, but go on the social side for me. For, this is my deep point. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, really. Just a few things before I pose the question, because I already see some people are leaving. So as you know, and as Michela mentioned many times, uh, he's part of Ultima Generation or the last generation in Italy. So there are friends and please support them in any way you can. Uh, uh, Michela sent the details in the chat and we will for sure put those donation page and all the other relevant info in the description of the video that's going to be put online. I will post it on our forum and on, on our Mattermost. Also, uh, we are all doing all of this for free. So if you, I mean webinars, so if you have uh, the resources, feel free to donate uh, to either uh, Ultimate Generation or DM25. Uh, both would be the best, of course. <laughs> so you can find the details in the chat. Uh, Mikel sent it already. Here is for DM25 as well. And uh, ultimately, just one more thing. So we are going to be speaking about the details of DM25 specific campaigning and how to form local collectives, how to engage with other people in your area on our next activist meetings. Uh, activist meetings are happening each month uh, first Wednesday of the month, month at 7 p.m. Central European time. You can find them in our calendar. I will also send the link in the chat so you can find out all the specifics there. Uh, now, finally, to ask you, Mikel, from my perspective, uh, so I was engaged with direct actions before, especially before I joined DM25. But uh, what I saw, what I've seen as a certain obstacle is for people who weren't engaged with direct actions before to get started to do it the first time. What would you like suggest to them? Usually I always tell them that you need to go through the ice for the first time, then it gets much, much easier, <laughs> of course. But uh, I was wondering what are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't know, I, as I told before, I don't think anyone has the right words. I think that the point is uh, uh, the social space, the sociability design. So 
what we try to do the most uh, is that uh, uh, we don't try to think to take it as an individualistic decision. So like uh, I concretize it. So we are in a public meeting, uh, we are 10 people and we put five people in a circle and five people in another circle so they can look at it and in the, in the eyes of each other. And we ask them, uh, do you want to make civil resistance? And what are we afraid of? And what do you need? What do you need to make this decision? So we take notes. Maybe someone needs a friend, maybe someone needs reassurances on the legal uh, problems, uh, but the point is let them speak about what they are afraid of, uh, because the point they say they are afraid uh, is the point they start to take in consideration of uh, overcoming their fears. So I, I don't think there is way I tell people, you open your fears and they overcome the fears uh, because I'm scared too. Um, I think that the point is, uh, designing uh, a proximity of emotional engagement. So um, the, I think that the, the, there, are, there are many points of that. You can see some video of Roger Allam of how we designed the mobilization of 2019 for Extinction Rebellion. And it is mostly based on the, the, on the fact that the people talk to each other about their emotion and their fears of uh, getting arrested or doing civil disobedience. And is not based on some people that has some way of convincing the others, because people have uh, to express uh, "I'm scared of," uh, and when you express "I'm scared of," you're up to me. So I can tell you my story. I can tell you my story, and <laughs> I, I, as I told you, I find out that it was the same story of many other people that now are leading some uh, some movements in the Um I was a uh, um, I was upset because uh, there was no radical activism for the climate change in Italy uh, two years ago. And uh, found this uh, amazing action that was on uh, Extinction Rebellion uh, uh, channels. And there was some instruction for doing it. And it was calling Rebell Rebellion of One. Um, and then I see Amir. Um, it was called Rebellion of One. It was make. Uh, it was an action that you go to block the road alone with a banner. Up ah, with the banner here and the banner there. And uh, in there was a video for training to prepare to block a road alone. And um, and uh, there was uh, some uh, uh, well, there was uh, um, some kind of spiritual guide in order to take bravery of blocking a street alone. And uh, this spiritual guide was based on questions. So uh, ask yourself what are you afraid of? Uh, ask yourself uh, what do you want to say to people? Are you afraid that people think you're stupid? Okay. And uh, through these. Is it me or we lost Mikel? Might be we lost him. Lost him, I think. Back. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I'm here. No worries. Um, as, I, as I told you, uh, through these questions, uh, it helped me. It helped me. Um, it was not through telling me what to do. It was through those questions. And I think you can maximize this. And the uh, last things, uh, the second part of your question, I think that part of how to convince people was the, based on the design of proximity. So if you tell people we will make civil disobedience in three months, it doesn't work. If you tell them we will make a little civil disobedience, so if they now experience something very easy, something not risky, like in three days, uh, we go to the city center and we put out a banner and we say a slogan against the major, or we go uh, on, the, on the cross line and uh, it's almost legal. We walk on the cross line with the banner 10 times and we block uh, it we block we block the cars for 10 minutes no more and no legal risk it's very easy after 10 minutes we go but you try okay and you give after after the first meeting three, three days after you are doing this very low level civil disobedience so it's also a question of design on how make the passages as fast as possible because if they think too much uh, they'll the the focus but yes yeah, no way like I think such ability and people talking about their emotion with each other is the best way. They convince each other. You never, I don't think you convince people on these things like taking risk and being brave. Yeah, makes sense. That's really helpful. 
thanks. Uh, so I think we should proceed to the last part of the workshop. Michaela, how do you see this? Uh, do you want do you want to moderate? Or I know that you had some idea about uh, talking about the new possible DM25 uh, campaigns. Ah, uh, yeah, no, I, I think, I don't think we can, uh, uh, no, no, re repeat, sorry, because I told you, I don't know if I told you, but they had a big, big familiar problem. Um, so I'm not so, that. Um... Sorry to hear that, no worries at all. Uh, yeah, uh, Michaela's plan was to talk about the potential actions uh, for the future. Uh, yes, this is a question for you, other 20 minutes. I think it's very relevant. So I, I'm happy that the N25 uh, is listening and is looking to people making civil disobedience for the climate change. And so I want to listen like as a free dialogue, other 20 minutes, if someone uh, uh, makes an idea like on kind of direct action campaign that uh, the N25 could do. Uh, so if someone of you has idea, what, what that would maybe can like on how to use the civil disobedience and of course civil disobedience is not to told you like there are many ways that, that are different what i told you for doing it and uh, in, i met some of you as some idea on how to and dm25 can use civil disobedience and i want to listen if you want to share Maybe I can start and then pass the word to our membership because it would be crazy just for the campaigning coordinator to talk about it. Uh, but uh, let me reveal you some some secrets. <laughs> uh, we are running in Bremen for the local elections. And what's going on is that we will for sure not use the standard political party procedure to do that. We are going to do direct actions and civil disobedience, of course. And uh, for now, just to get your imagination running, some of the things that we are going to do are uh, protesting in front of the big real estate company in Bremen that raised the housing prices with uh, having a projection on, on their building with our slogan uh, against uh, housing crisis and that that should be a living right uh, besides that uh, we are going to explain the people on the ground how we are fighting this with our signs bring down the oligarchy and uh, the housing crisis didn't happen out, uh, out of nowhere but the people who raised it who created it have their names and addresses and we are going to project that on the building with our leaflets and so on and so on uh, ultimately we are going to try to disturb their work by having the whistles and megaphones there and so on and so on. We are also going to do some actions on environment. Uh, what is in the work now is, now is having a big wooden structure with hanging ropes. I think even Ultimate Generation did, some, did something similar. Uh, and activists standing on those hanging ropes with the ice cubes beneath them portraying how uh, global warming is going to kill us all and the wooden structure is going to be like all over the wooden structure there are going to be slogans like sponsored by Shell, sponsored by Eon uh, and, and similar. So these are just some of the ideas that we are going to do in the next few months. But as I said, it's absurd for the campaigning coordinator to speak uh, only on this. So please feel free to, to share either the experiences you have, the desires that you have, your plans, or to ask questions. Even that is OK. We have like 15 minutes more. Is it OK if I speak again, Dushan? Absolutely, no worries. <laughs> okay, I just want to say that I'm, I'm really sorry that I have a lifestyle that um, I live in countries or in cities where uh, DN25 is not really active. So I cannot really then do campaigns with DN25 because they are, even if there are some, like for example, in Vienna, it was about Assange, they were somehow insignificant, like six people just in the street every month. For Assange and free speech. Um, yeah, so then because I live uh, 
in different cities, then I try to be active there, to be activist. And I, uh, I'm now uh, working with students on the recycling campaign because in the Dublin City University, um, or in general, I think here the, the level of uh, awareness for recycling is very low and the country is very dirty, <laughs> so to speak. And um, I, we would like to put this in order at least across the campuses. And uh, now the first thing we want to do is to speak uh, to the manager of the sustainability department to make sure that even if there are some sorting out of the, the garbage, that this actually goes uh, to the right bin because we noticed that uh, the, the people who are um, collecting the trash they're putting everything in one bag just like in the Balkans yeah so uh, first we want to make sure that this is in, in place and then we want to do some uh, campaigns um, and of course one would be uh, the, the only traditional things come to my mind like would be to you know across the campuses to maybe leaflets uh, to, to, to spread the leaflets or talk to people. But I guess through, through this uh, presentation, I understood that we have to do something more radical. And uh, I would like to, to hear maybe, this is very significant campaign, campaign in comparison to what you talked about, but still I'm sharing. I feel I was very uh, boring because uh, everybody just uh, disappeared. <laughs> Oh, I think we lost Dushan. Uh, mm. Maybe, uh, maybe Mizanur. Internet problems. Sorry, it's like this in Balkans. No problem. Uh, yeah, Mizanur, please. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, no problems. Uh, sorry, this is my first meeting, so it's very, very uh, interesting so far. Um, I'm from London, and uh, so, Dusan, um, I'm I'm going I'm sending you an email as as I speak. I'm typing it up. Um, I mean, the thing is, is I just want to quickly say. Obviously, Dusan said that. Look, you can say, you know, what you what your ideas are in terms of campaigning or what you desire to campaign. I think living in London, I'm, and this is why I asked how many people from London are here, because living in London, we have a for me, we have a very big problem in regards to the square mile and the kind of kind of like colonial relationship that 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 kind of part of London has with the rest of London. We don't really know what the effect that that's having. And obviously in London, there, there, we have a super rich elite that basically live in a way that um, is, you know, that that and have access to things that we don't have. So. I have some friends obviously involved in the M25 as well that are looking into, that are interested into issues specific to like financial inequality in London. And we are looking on maybe developing a campaign on addressing that issue as well. Um, I think that for me as an activist, I've been an activist for a very long time, but sp focusing on these issues in London, we don't really talk about. And I think the M25, is a very important platform where we can address uh, the inequality within the city, with, within a city like the city of London, actually. So that's something I'm looking into. Um, and if anyone has any advice on how to develop a campaign around that, or what are specific problems related to London or around that, that would be great to know. Thanks. Many thanks. Uh, I will give the word to others, not to get too much space, to take too much space but if you want to you can email me uh, to discuss this idea specifically and you can as i said uh, come to this next activist meeting if you have time this is where i answer those questions by a membership in order to help you create a certain plan uh, but if someone wants to have a comment on this or on what yelena said i didn't have the chance because of the internet connection problems to hear everything that she said but uh please please come uh come up if i may talk a bit about the yeah, recycling um 
Hang on, I'm not quite sure if it's working here. <laughs> okay, here I am. Um, uh, last part of my working life, I was working on recycling, uh, doing uh, developing a project for recycling for the American army in Heidelberg in Germany, which uh, is a very good insight on when you're talking about recycling. Um, the, the I found the best way of getting things across was the costs. What costs what? What did that, if they could recycle, how much money could be saved through that? Getting that information uh, might be difficult. I was lucky and I, had, I worked with the, the uh, municipality of Heidelberg together. They were the main contractor for it. But the, if you can come up with costs, that's usually a very good driver for, for getting people interested in recycling. But you do need to make sure that what is recycled is going back to recycling, not as uh, we've seen, uh, I think the BBC or one of them did a followed up or Sky, and we found out all the stuff was going to China because it was cheaper to export the rubbish. But that's, if I can pass it on to you, that I found that very helpful. Other than that, we went through a very big education campaign with the kids. We had we had the kids coming. The kids were great because they would go home and teach the parents. Uh, it was another way of doing it. Uh, it was um, it was the best job I had in my life, to be honest with you, talking trash. But, it, you know, what, what in the hell, that's what, what you got paid for. Okay, thank you for listening. Can I just jump in now? Because it, it was a, a comment yeah, on, on what, what I said. Not Please, not from the policy side. We can have this discussion later on. Uh, no, no, but uh -huh. I, I mean, uh, of course, the, there is a person who wants to talk. I just wanted to uh, ask Travis to just uh, maybe specify this th thing about costs, because I'm not sure that it works in the same manner in Dublin. Uh, I just know that individuals here have to pay additional money in order to get the bin when they recycle. So basically, it costs you more money to recycle here. That's how government is stimulating citizens to recycle. Oh, yeah. that's, that's really working negatively, isn't it? Um, uh, yeah. I, I can't answer that for Dublin. Sorry. I, I, I said we worked out that with, if people recycled, used what they call the yellow bag here, et cetera, uh, which was... We said at no cost, not quite true, because when they bought things in the supermarkets, there was a one or two pennings or cents on the packaging you paid for up front. Uh, but the, it was a lot cheaper than going in the mixed refuse, rubbish, whatever you want to call it, which then went to the incinerator. You know, that that was the, then the paper was separate, the glass was separate. Glass was great for recycling. Uh, paper was, was good as well. Uh, Sorry, I sorry to break I'm, I'm, I'm getting out. Okay. Uh, no, no, it's not you or or Jagan at all. We are just really, really short on time, so I'm trying just to stay on topic while we have Mikhail here. It, I, I tell you, I'm sorry. I'll give, but, I'll give uh, Jelena my email address, okay, and then she can talk yeah. to me. Yeah, exchange emails, please, or even write in the chat. I'm just being cautious of the time. Nothing else. It's important gotcha. discussion. Okay, but, no um, problem. Okay, uh, we have three more questions, then we wrap it up. We don't want to keep Mikel too much here. I know he's busy and he has some problems. And thank you very much for staying with us, Mikel, really, and for doing this once again. Uh, I don't know Greek alphabet, so I'm sorry, but yeah, that's you being next. Then Amir and then Kurt, and then we wrap this up. <laughs> We cannot hear you for some reason, sorry. Even though it's written that you are unmuted. Maybe while you fix your microphone, we can let Amir go next and then hopefully you can. Great, great. Amir. Sure. Hi, Michele. Um, uh, grazie mille for the, for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, something that you said earlier on was about Gandhi and keeping the end of getting the British Empire out in mind. And I think for us, TM25 is about the oligarchy, about capitalism and so on. And in a sense, we could, um, something as a just to throw in there is, no matter what it is, that the ultimate aim is to link it back to the oligarchy. If it's the 
uh, in that sense, recycling, you know, who's making money off that and which capitalist is taking it and then di directly confronting uh, that uh, organizations or corporations or those individuals, whether it's uh, in front of the buildings and so on. Um, so that's just something to throw in there is that, you know, trying to link everything together with that ultimate aim that you mentioned earlier on. Thanks. Thanks, Amir. Uh, Amir is also our policy coordinator, so he has regular calls on policy if you'd like to debate those stuff as well, not just campaigning elections. Uh, now let's try again, maybe our friend from Greece. If it works, no? No, no? okay. <laughs> Write it in the chat and maybe uh, we can read it if it's not too much of, of a work. Kurt, last but not least. Hi, hi Miguel. Uh, great presentation, by the way. Um, my question is, uh, you talked earlier about that when you're doing uh, when you when you're doing your protests or whatnot. The uh, generally, the, you, you use an example of somewhere I think a forest in Canada, which kind of brought to my mind because what's happening in my community is the. Uh, Hydro hydro company is deciding to put in a put in a power line, and they're they're not taking any of the considerations of the property owners, the people's houses, or ta da ta da ta da along the road. So a lot of the owners are so upset, and they're like, even if they face expropriation, they're planning to blockade their properties. So from what you say, they'd be better off blockading a highway than to do it uh, like on a route like where basically nobody will see what's going on unless. The newspapers or the TV happen to come by. Is that correct? This is more or less an idea. <clears throat> so it is, I, I, I don't have absolute answers. So it is a, it always depends on a contextual analysis. So, I mean, if you have 100 people and you want to make a difference, with 100 people, you can uh, enter in every talk show of your nation if they disrupt the public. But if they go to the, I don't know, to the, to the maybe 100 people and you are a climate change campaign, you interrupt the public on an highway and everyone will talk about, you have only 100 people and you go to the government and no one notice. Uh, at least you don't paint the government uh, uh, in pink. <laughs> okay, no one notice because uh, you are not in the public attention, but this is a contextual analysis. So as soon as you get 10,000 people, you get to stop the direct polluter. But if you don't have 10,000, 100,000 people, no one notice. And so you are not changing the public opinion. So this is a contextual analysis. As far as I see, <clears throat> one of the main problem, according to Chino and Steven, why civil resistance is not working anymore, is that we don't uh, use many different tactics uh, in, a, in, a, in a full complex design. So if you have uh, a few people, you get the public attention, then you grow, and then you get to the, then it comes a point in which you stop disrupting the public and you have the government at the end of the design. But uh, you have to consider the, the, the point you are, how many people you have, uh, and uh, how you can maximize uh, the result uh, with the quantity of people you have. So if you have not that many people and you go to block a coal, uh, uh, a coal uh, uh, energy station, no one notice. If you have not that many people and you disrupt, uh, you disrupt uh, art exhibition, uh, people will talk about you and about what you did in television. And so this is only the beginning. I'm not telling that it is absolutely right. This is something you have to start to get the public attention. Then you can also stop disrupting people and start disrupting the government only. But you, this is the end of the game. You, you have to, um, to make many steps in, to get to, to the point uh, in which you really want to get. You cannot get to the enemy directly because you are too because it's too strong for you if you get if you go there directly this is uh, some kind of the idea of uh, guerrilla but this is non-violent okay before you make guerrilla and when you have uh, when your enemy is not that strong uh, you go directly facing the enemy so this is uh, this is the same way of thinking of uh, war okay but this is non-violence all right, so based on context, all right, thank you. That's a really important uh, insight that you highlighted here. Uh, as I said, uh, this recording will be available for our members uh, on locked link on our uh, YouTube channel with all the details 
of me, of Michela, of Ultima Generation and DM25. And Michela, if you have time, please send us the presentation so we can also put it in the in the attachment of the description. Thanks. Uh, if there are no uh, other questions, uh, let's conclude this meet. Ah, yeah, you wrote it in the chat. Our friend from Greece. Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't. I will read it out loud. Maybe it's easier. I really like the graph with the non-violent revolutions being more successful than the violent ones. It was also mentioned that the revolution should be emotional if I understood correctly. My question is, can't emotion be backed up rationally and get the point across? I'm just worried about emotional peeping or being more violent. That's a nice psychological question. Uh, question. Do you want to take it, Mikhail? No, absolute answer. It depends on the discipline of the movement. So, first of all, I don't. I generally don't appreciate the idea that emotion is disconnected with rationality. I think very much the opposite. I think that uh, there are some neurological confirmation that uh, people, in order to make a very high level performance in a co in, in a cognitive task, uh, have to feel some level of anxiety or of uh, a rage coming out of agonism. And if they don't feel that, they don't perform that much. And so this is quite a motion that is connected to, to improving rational performances. Um, the other way around is I see that, um, um, is that there is many people that has a very high level QE, which is very intelligent, but is stupid morally. And they are going on to destroy the planet, even if they know. And if, if they made a math, they are very good at math, but they are assholes because they are not uh, uh, any more connected uh, with the emotional reality. And this is the, the main problem, it's not their, in, their uh, intelligence. But about what you say, yes, it is, it is important when you're talking about mass emotion that uh, many rage can bring to violence and it is difficult. So this is uh, the reason you have to set up a leadership into the movement and not leaderless. And with leader, I don't mean one leader. I mean uh, many, 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 many leaders. So many people that uh, can, uh, uh, can train other people in nonviolence. So there is another side of the story I told you. There is a wonderful documentary on uh, Freedom Riders. You find it on YouTube. You find Roger Allen and Tilly Rowland, which are two main activists uh, uh, that uh, commentated this documentary. But one of the main things of the story of the Freedom Riders is not the, uh, only what happened that summer is that many of those people have taken massive bravery going to prison when there was no action anymore in the rest of the movement. And when they went out of the prison and they had a victory, they became leader. They became Anders of leader from the, from the civil resistance movements. And uh, as, soon, uh, as soon as um, Martin Luther King died, of course, it is an oversimplification. As soon as Martin Luther King died, uh, the, the, the fight for the, for, the, for the black liberation in the US uh, went uh, more likely to get violent, violence because there was not that, 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 that leadership anymore. There was not diffused leadership. So the, the best way to prevent it is maximize, maximize the leadership. I try to concretize very easily. Maybe you have a mass participation and what what uh, what, Gan, what Martin Luther King did when there were some mass participation and he was afraid of people getting violent because they were upset with the government and with the segregation, he was uh, uh, opening the church at nine at night and training many people in uh, uh, peacemaking during a, a demonstration. And so uh, they were very 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 careful. They had like one people every. 12 meters that was able to control uh, peace and peacefully de-escalate the situation and also peacefully block if someone is violent without like not beating about blocking okay and they were trained to make this so we concretizing uh, the the best way is uh, uh, training people in non-violence and and uh, positioning them at the right distance in a mass demonstration in order that they can keep control of the space um, this is the best, uh, the best way. So create as many nonviolent leaders as possible. This is the, this is the way to keep uh, things better. 
I never done it. Like I never worked with more than than uh, 150 people. Okay, so this is, I, I know this is how it, you make it in theory, and I don't. I never done it before. I really hope that I will get to that point. Okay, so I I, I don't know the details. I don't know many things about this very difficult task. True, true. But uh, as a social psychologist, which is my long lost profession i approve <laughs> this answer in terms of dichotomy between uh, rationality and emotions some psychologists even say that it's an outdated false dichotomy but that's a whole another sphere of questions uh we are past the hour but we have one more question if it's all right with you uh yes perfect L last uh, one please, please go on let's go for the last Did you say me? Yes, yes, please go on. All right, because that did help. Yeah, I have my hand up. Okay, well, I was, for, for several years, I was um, communications officer for Labour International, which was the international section of the Labour Party. And it was like you said, Mikhail, um, more than 12 hours a day, probably working very hard um, on tiny income. I have a very tiny pension. And then they started paying rent for this office that I'm in. Uh, but then I got expelled from the party because we've got a new leader and uh, I was a Corbyn supporter and the new leader doesn't like 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 them. Uh, so I'm looking for new things. But of course, all, all, all of our action had to be online with Labour International because we had members all over the world. Um, so I got used to doing stuff online. Of course, we had some differences because we had elected committees and lots of rules and motions and agendas and everything. So that would be a bit different from your kind of activism. Um, I'm looking for new new things to do, and I got just got involved with um, the news clubs in Jeremy Corbyn's Peace and Justice project. Um, I'm organising an international one, um, but I'm trying trying to get people active online and to get them to actually join and come to a meeting. I'm finding that a bit of a bit of a problem. Would like some advice on that. And also, if any of you want to come to our first meeting, you'll be very welcome. I, I put a link in the chat. Uh, there, there, are, there are also news clubs in other parts. I mean, for example, South London. If you're in South London, uh, Ms. Anur, uh, that might be something you'd like to join. You have a meeting once a month, discuss the news. Eventually, they want to set up their own media. But it also could be a source of finding other activists um and getting the news of what's going on around the place and what campaigns are going on um but anyway any advice michael on online activism and online um disruptive civil disobedience can that be done sorry can you hear me my yes. idea is that um uh, it depends what you say. The only thing that I think it may work uh, is aching. So professional acres is the only thing you can seriously disrupt. That, uh, according to me, say that word again. Sorry, I didn't catch it. Like acre, yeah. acre, like entering the website, uh, creating disruption into website functioning, creating dysfunction into the government computers. Oh, you mean this kind is the of only hacking, thing. right? Yes, but th yeah. please, this is the only things that make sense to, according to disruption and making activism online. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that we we, we have to use uh, we, we have to improve uh, in online organizing or using online tools for uh, uh, putting people together in a disruptive event. So it's something that we are trying to learn. We are going to make a rave party, which is almost legal. And uh, then people get into the street and they dance and block the street for 12 mm -hmm. hours. And we will we'll have to learn to use internet in order to add our message to millions of people and not thousands of people. Nice. About aching, there is something that it was, um, for me, strug I str I'm struggling with the acre mentality. So I had some conversation with some people from Anonymous. They organize uh, in a very horizontal line. They have no strategy, no long-term organization. And um, I told them the same thing I told you with the public. Uh, this is my opinion, that uh, even if you are a good acre, you enter in the website of the government, uh, you take out some data and you make them public, the vast majority of the public doesn't give a fuck like of you being very good uh, disrupting the government website because they control the information. 
So maybe you, you take out some information from the government and you make them public like Julian Assange, but they still control the information. So the people that really cares about Julian Assange is a few minority of intelligent people. So I, I told some acres, some anonymous acre, why don't you change and why don't you reverse your mentality? So before, uh, before uh, uh, going against the enemy, you make the opposite. So you try to change public opinion by disrupting some small fishes, like you enter into the media and you put out like uh, a big sign with Britain, you will die for climate emergency. And the uh, people wake up in the nation with the phone and they have this message, you will die for climate emergency. And then you go on the street, on the motorway, and are this, the public sign on the motorway, and there is written, you will die for public and for, public, for climate emergency. Make this for three months. And it is very easy because if you know how to enter in a multinational or in, the, in a state government website, you know how to change a sign in the road and you know how to enter the television and put something. And you make all it is for three months. And whenever you get a chance, you hire and send out the same message. I'm sure that it will be the biggest change of public opinion in the fastest, in the fastest way as possible. Uh, but uh, many of them told me that it's not ethical because they only attack the enemy. They don't, they, they don't disrupt the public. And so I told them many way, I'm sure there is some so good sociological basis, some good analytical basis, some good strategical basis but there was a lot of ethical and ideological way of saying, oh, we don't disrupt the public, we disrupt the big enemy because we revenge against the enemy and stuff like that. And I told them, hey, oh, I don't know if you're right. Okay, you're very good, but I don't know if you're right Be that it is the fastest way. And I think that aching is the future for being in down governments, but I think we have to make it in a strategic uh, way. And uh, because, yes, as I told you, you fuck up the, 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 the documents of a government, but the government controls the media. So no one knows that you have fuck up the, the, the documents of the government. Mm -hmm. So who cares? You are going to prison. <laughs> who cares? Okay. Uh, this, is, this is very difficult. Mm -hmm. and who... Interesting, thanks. Thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you all for being here once again. Mikel and Ultima uh, Generation, special thanks to you. Uh, as you know, uh, for the next couple of months, we are going to have these uh, regular sessions. Michele is kind enough to be with us once, uh, once a month to have better theoretical and practical overview of direct actions and civil disobedience. So please make sure to check our forums, newsletters, matter most. You can find us anywhere, calendar in the end of the day. So I'm sure we all see each other uh, again. Uh, I very much enjoyed this and I hope all of you uh, were. Many thanks and carpe diem. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank Bye. you. Bye -bye. Very, very good, Bye very interesting. Too. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thanks I love this much. a lot. Thank you much. Mm -hmm.